Welcome to the series, How to Engage with Cyber Policy, Tools for Human Rights Defenders. Over the course of the next 15 videos, we'll be exploring a range of different cyber policy issues and discussing why they're important from a human rights perspective. But first, why are we focusing on cyber policy? Today, the term cyber is used to cover a range of things related to policymaking in the digital age. This series will explore some of the most topical issues, showing you why they're relevant and how you can get involved. The four modules of the series will focus on cybersecurity, human rights, regulatory frameworks and policymaking processes, cyber capacity building. Three more videos will then look at these issues from a regional perspective, focusing on Africa, Asia and Latin America. By the end, we hope you'll have a better understanding of cyber policy issues and why they're relevant to human rights, a solid grasp of the different actors involved and processes at play, and, most importantly, the tools and confidence you need to get involved in these debates. So how did we get here? In the 90s, the early pioneers of the internet often conceived it as a new world. As John Perry Barlow's famous Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace in 1996 put it, Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us, you have no sovereignty where we gather. In other words, this new world was supposed to be free from governmental influence. And indeed, until recently, the internet was something of a grey area for legislation, and in some respects really seemed ungoverned. This is changing. Part of the reason is the success of the information revolution. It has rapidly digitised many aspects of human life, from infrastructure and communications to development, economics, law and culture, blurring the line between online and offline life. Along with the many benefits gained, it has also created real threats, like identity theft, financial fraud, attacks on critical infrastructure and corporate data breaches. As a result, states are pushing for new laws and regulation. Cyberspace has become political. Another reason is the general trend of securitization in public discourse, which became dominant after 9-11. Securitization is the process by which certain actors transform an issue into a security concern. These can be governmental actors, individuals or companies. Once this is done, the issue in question often attracts a disproportionate share of attention and can be used to justify extraordinary security measures, for example, a state of emergency or an internet shutdown. The securitized solution is often disproportionate to the original problem and it can be used to shut down conversations about human rights. For example, in many cyber policy debates, a dichotomy is posed between cybersecurity and human rights. You can't have one without harming or even losing the other, so this argument goes. And if you object to these extraordinary measures, which often impact fundamental freedoms and human rights, you can be accused of not caring about security or even aiding criminals. Let's take a look at two examples. In Uganda, during the general election in February 2016, the government ordered local mobile service providers to block social media platforms such as Twitter, Facebook and WhatsApp. Since most internet traffic in Uganda goes through mobile networks, this was essentially an internet shutdown which affected the entire voting population. The government's rationale was simple. These platforms are a threat to public order and safety. In other words, the government was worried about demonstrations and potential violence. But critically, as a related open letter highlighted, this kind of securitized rationale leads to disproportionate and harmful responses. Justified for public safety purposes, shutdowns instead cut off access to vital information, e-financing and emergency services, plunging whole societies into fear and destabilizing the Internet's power to support small business livelihoods and drive economic development. In the UK, the Investigative Powers Bill offers a similar example. Introduced in 2015 and currently under discussion, it has been criticised for legalising equipment interference, bulk interception and other far-reaching surveillance measures. These proposals would clearly undermine the right to privacy. The UK government has tried to justify the bill on grounds of national security. The risks of cybercrime and terrorism, they argue, justify any potential restrictions on individual freedoms. But as pointed out by Privacy International, a vocal critic of the bill, the government struggles to justify these powers. 
If adopted as currently envisaged, the bill would codify a practice of mass, untargeted surveillance by the UK intelligence services that treat everyone as suspects. These powers are not lawful nor necessary or proportionate. They also set a terrible international precedent. These are not isolated examples. Similar instances are occurring all across the world, and these trends are being replicated in regional and international debates. This is why we call the dichotomy of cybersecurity and human rights into question. Why does there have to be a trade-off? In fact, security is the basis for human rights and vice versa. One can't exist without the other. A definition which aims to capture this frames cybersecurity as the preservation through law, policy, technology and education of the availability, confidentiality and integrity of information and its underlying infrastructure so as to enhance the security of persons both online and offline. This means that when viewed from a human rights-based user-centric perspective, cybersecurity isn't just about the security of systems. It's about encryption, anonymity, access, infrastructure development, net neutrality, digital literacy, cybercrime, market regulation, data ethics, and more. It's crucial that we begin to discuss these issues with a view to preserving human rights, not infringing them. Everyone who uses the internet can be a human rights defender. Employees of businesses, programmers, government officials and, of course, civil society all have a role to play. As mentioned earlier, debates on cyber policies are increasingly pitting human rights against security. The huge range of governmental and corporate activities now being carried out under the banner of cyber policies cover a lot more than just national security concerns. And scrutinising and inputting into these debates from a human rights perspective is crucial. But to get involved, you first need to know the actors, institutions and issues at stake, which can be easier said than done. Cyber issues are complicated. They involve a lot of technical language and a lot of institutions. Debates can seem closed and unwelcoming. Getting even the basic knowledge and resources needed to engage is hard enough. Getting a seat at the table is harder. The aim of this series is to help you overcome these obstacles. Cyber issues differ from country to country. This series hopes to provide the starting point for civil society all over the world to kickstart debates on cyber policies and to help rebalance existing debates to reflect both human rights and security. Engagement needs to be undertaken at the national, regional and global levels with clear, defined goals which are relevant to each constituency. The series will help you navigate the maze of legal frameworks. We'll demystify the different bodies, forums and networks where they are discussed and will familiarise you with the actors involved, from national governments and bodies tasked with infrastructure protection to bodies fighting cybercrime and providing intelligence. This can be complicated, as this interactive map of cybersecurity institutions in India shows. Each of the videos in the series will take you through a definition of the issue, why it's important for human rights in the digital age, the bodies, forums and legal frameworks that guide the topic, case studies to illustrate the concepts, and how to get involved. Live online Q&A sessions will accompany each of the four modules, giving you a chance to pose any burning questions to experts in the field. You can also find further resources on each issue on the GPD website. We hope you enjoy the series.